This is a video that was produced for our Cold Case Detective channel, a new true crime channel that we created. We're uploading it here so those who do not know about our new channel and are not subscribed can see the sort of content we're producing there. Don't forget to check out the new channel in the link in the description, and we hope you enjoy this Cold Case Detective video. Children are supposed to be playful and innocent, and their anger is supposed to be unleashed in the form of tantrums and not much else. However, there are many children out there whose anger and resentment develops into something much worse. Hatred. It is this hatred which often drives these people to commit and participate in unspeakable, heinous crimes. In today's episode of Cold Case Detective, we'll be exploring three of these terrifying murderous children. Craig Price Dubbed by the media as the Warwick Slasher, Craig Chandler Price was just 13 years old when he killed his first victim. Born October the 11th, 1973 in Rhode Island, there is little known about Craig's family life and upbringing. What is known is that from a young age he had a juvenile record that included charges of robbery, stalking, assault and drug use. Despite his questionable criminal record, Nobody expected the young boy to take a life. On July the 27th, 1987, Craig broke into the home of 27-year-old Rebecca Spencer, a woman who lived just two doors down from him. He stabbed her 58 times with a kitchen knife. Then, on September the 1st, 1989, when Craig was 15, he broke into the home of 39-year-old Joan Heaton, who resided there with her two daughters, intending to rob the residence. High on weed and LSD at the time, he stabbed Joan 57 times. He then stabbed her 10-year-old daughter Jennifer 62 times and her 8-year-old Melissa 30 times. Melissa also suffered a crushed skull due to Craig pulverizing her with a kitchen stool. He even bit Joan and one of the girls. Craig's attack on the family was so aggressive that the blades of the knives he used broke off from the handles, staying inside the bodies of the victims. Despite the fact that Craig lived near to both crime scenes, along with having a juvenile record, police did not consider him a suspect until the FBI linked both crimes together, stating that they were likely committed by someone living nearby, and had his hand injured in the struggle. On September the 5th, 1989, when two police officers interviewed the 15-year-old, they noticed the cut on his hand. Craig told authorities that he'd cut it while drunk. He then went on to fail a polygraph test. This combination of suspect things led to police gaining a search warrant for his home, where they found bloody clothes and knives. Upon being discovered, it said that Craig's demeanour and tone were both calm. He confessed without further pressing, and law enforcement described his admittance as lacking in remorse. Even worse is that he went on to mimic the sounds of his victims dying as he confessed to the crimes. Craig believes that his exposure to racism as a young child is a contributing factor in the motive for the murders. He was arrested one month before his 16th birthday, and bragged he'd make history when released, as he'd been tried and convicted as a juvenile and would be released at age 21. The case of Craig Price later led to law changes, which allowed juveniles to be charged as adults, but this couldn't be applied retroactively. Rhode Island residents formed citizens opposed to the release of Craig Price to lobby for his imprisonment, given the brutal nature of the crime. Several state psychologists agreed that Craig was a poor candidate for rehab. Whilst in prison, Craig has been charged with a number of additional crimes. Criminal contempt for refusing a psychological evaluation, extortion for threatening a corrections officer, assault and violation of probation, for fights he participated in whilst imprisoned. Thanks to these crimes, Craig Price did not see freedom on his 21st birthday. Initially, he was set to be released in 2022, after being denied parole in 2009, but in April 2017, he was accused of stabbing another inmate with a 5-inch homemade knife, and on January the 18th, 2019, 
he was sentenced to a further 25 years in jail. He is now 46 years old, and Rhode Islanders are sleeping soundly, knowing the Warwick Slasher will remain behind bars for the rest of his life. Graham Frederick Young Born in Middlesex, England in September of 1947, Graham Frederick Young was fascinated by poisons from a young age. His interest quickly turned sinister when he began to experiment on the people around him, but it took a long time for Graham to finally be caught and put behind bars for good. In 1961, Graham began to poison his family so he could study the effects the substances had on the human body. He started with his stepmother, 37-year-old Molly, who suffered unexplained vomiting, diarrhoea and stomach pains. His father, Fred, aged 44, soon followed in her footsteps. Then finally Graham's sister, Winifred, began to feel the effects, as well as several of his friends. Graham fell ill too, but to a lesser degree. It's not known if this was intentional or an accident. Later in November 1961, Winifred was served tea by Graham, and she took only one mouthful before spitting it out as it tasted sour. On her morning commute, she found herself hallucinating and was sent to the hospital, where it was discovered that she had been exposed to Atropa belladonna, also known as deadly nightshade, a plant which is extremely toxic when ingested. When Fred confronted his son about this, Graham retaliated by blaming his sister for mixing her shampoos in the teacups. Fred found nothing incriminating in his son's bedroom, but told him to be more careful. It was only six months later on April the 21st, 1962, that Molly Young died from poisoning, and Fred was taken to the hospital, where he was told that just one more dose of poison would have killed him. On the back of this turn of events, Graham's aunt became suspicious of him, as did his science teacher, who found bottles of poisons in his desk and reported it to the school principal. Graham was sent to a psychiatrist and was arrested on May the 23rd, 1962. He confessed to the attempted murder of Fred, Winifred, and one of his friends. Molly's death was not considered suspicious, given that she'd sustained a prolapse of her spinal bone in a traffic accident, and there was no way for investigators to check her cause of death as she'd been cremated at Graham's suggestion. The 15-year-old was detained under the Mental Health Act at Broadmoor Hospital, and was subsequently diagnosed with personality disorder and schizophrenia. Later analysis of Graham's behaviours and personality indicated he may also have been on the autism scale too. 1970 saw Graham tell the hospital psychiatrist that he was no longer obsessed with poison and violence, but in secret, he was studying medical texts and experimenting on inmates and staff, one of whom died due to his investigations. A year later, in February 1971, Graham was released, supposedly fully recovered. He got a job at a laboratory, which was not informed of his past conviction, and his probation officer never checked in with him. Not long after the now 24-year-old started work, his foreman became ill and died. Sickness swept through his workplace, and was mistaken for a virus. Some of his colleagues even required hospitalisation. It seemed Graham Young's famous tea was making its rounds again. It's believed about seven people were non-fatally poisoned, and after the new foreman became sick, he quickly quit the job. Another workmate became Graham's fourth and final victim. Suspiciously, Graham asked the company doctor if thallium had been considered, and he told one of his colleagues that he studied chemicals as a hobby. Alarmed, the workmates then went to the police with this information, leading to Graham's second arrest on November 21st, 1971. Authorities found several poisons on his person and in his home, plus a diary which noted the doses, effects, and whether he'd let someone live or die. Despite the evidence stacking up against him, Graham pleaded not guilty, claiming that the diary was simply a fantasy novel. This did not wash with the jury, who convicted him, and he was sentenced to life in prison. Behind bars, Graham befriended the infamous Ian Brady, the Scottish serial killer who was one half of the guilty party behind the Moors murders. They shared an obsession with Nazis and Hitler. Graham died one month before his 43rd birthday in August 1990 from a heart attack. He is known as the St Albans Poisoner 
and the teacup poisoner. Graham Young's disturbing crimes provoked a copycat when in November 2005, a 16-year-old Japanese schoolgirl was arrested for poisoning her mother with thallium. She claimed she was fascinated with Graham, having seen the 1995 black comedy on his life, called The Young Poisoner's Handbook. She kept an online blog like Graham kept a diary. Although no recent updates can be found, the girl's mother was in a coma in 2005. Sandy Charles Born in 1980 in northern Saskatchewan, there didn't appear to be anything odd or unusual about Canadian boy Sandy Charles. While there's little documented about his life before his crime, it seems apparent that nobody thought he was a child to be concerned about. All that changed in 1995. At 14 years old, Sandy was fascinated with the 1989 movie Warlock and watched it repeatedly. The horror film, rated 15, says that if a person drinks liquefied fat of an unbaptized child, they can fly or gain special powers. There is little information as to how Sandy conceived his plan, but on July the 8th, 1995, he stabbed a boy with a knife, beat him with a beer bottle and a rock, then cut strips of his skin from him and boiled them down. His victim was Jonathan George Timpson, born December the 30th, 1987. Described as playful and outgoing, the seven-year-old's hero was the masked crusader, Zorro. Jonathan's body was found just a few days later on July the 11th, in the woods a few hundred yards from his grandma's house. His head had been crushed, and his throat had been slashed. Ten to fifteen strips had been carved out from his skin. Sandy had had an eight-year-old accomplice named William Martin, who was too young to be tried at the time, but it's unknown what his role was in the killing. Whilst it's unclear what evidence led police to Sandy Charles' doorstep, he was later convicted as an adult and sent to a psychiatric hospital, having been found not guilty by reason of insanity in August of 1996. Sandy had told police officers, there's a spirit in my room which gave me these thoughts. Reportedly, the 14-year-old had been contemplating suicide when a voice told him that it might be just as good to kill someone else. He was later diagnosed as a schizophrenic. It was discovered that Sandy had ultimately suffocated Jonathan after a failed attempt at breaking the young boy's neck. A knife was also found lodged in Jonathan's eye. Sources conflict on whether or not Sandy consumed the boiled down fat which he'd taken and cooked from Jonathan's body. Allegedly he said that he did not drink it as he just wanted to stay the way he was. In June 2000, age 17, Sandy attacked a prison nurse, but only spent one day in solitary confinement as punishment. In 2014, he told a court that he wanted to be socialised enough to re-enter society, but his request to move to a different institute was denied. It's unlikely that Sandy Charles will be released from the psychiatric hospital in which he resides. So that's three cases of terrifying, murderous children. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.